So DNA sequencing is a process where you work out the actual order of the bases in a strand of DNA. It was first invented in 1980 by Frederick Sanger, and he won the Nobel Prize for working out this method. Now, in order to understand the method that he used, which was called chain termination, you need to know a bit about a few molecules. Firstly, we need to talk about the mononucleotides that are used during DNA replication. Now, these are actually called DNTPs. They contain the bases and the sugar, but they actually have three phosphates attached. Now, this wasn't mentioned when I did my DNA replication video. It's not something you'd necessarily mention until you get here, but actually the nucleotide is not the same structure um, when it's free as to when it is bonded. It's got these extra phosphates on as well. And DNTP stands for deoxyribose. The N stands for the, the, uh, the base, whether it's A, T, C, or G. And then the TP stands for triphosphate, because there's three phosphates. The second set of molecules that you all seem to know about are ones called dideoxynucleotides, now, or DDNTPs. Now, these are the same as the mononucleotides we just looked at, but they lack the OH group on the carbon-3 of deoxyribose, and therefore they cannot bind to the next phosphate group on the following nucleotide, as no phosphodiester bond can form. So they are missing that crucial OH group there. You can't join on uh, to another nucleotide um, at that point. A phosphate can't join there. And therefore, that's the end. If you were adding more nucleotides in onto a DNA strand, you just wouldn't be able to add another one in. You can't make a phosphodiester bond. So that would stop the process. It terminates the strand if you have one of those nucleotides there during PCR. Okay, so we need to know about those two molecules. We're going to talk about those and how they were used by Frederick Sanger to do chain termination. So this is the process. Step one, the DNA that is going to be sequenced is heated to break apart the two strands. Okay, you've got to break those hydrogen bonds um, to separate the two strands. Now a primer is then annealed to the five prime end of the template strand. The primed DNA is then added into four separate reaction vessels. Okay, so you add it into four separate vessels. And into those vessels, free nucleotides are added, the DNTP, so the ones that you'd have normally for DNA replication. You also need to add some DNA polymerase in because you need the enzyme that um, can make more DNA. And so the vessels start making complementary strands of, D of DNA in PCR as normal. But the last step is to add one of those DDNTPs into each of the reaction tubes. So we add a different one into each tube. So we add DDTTP into one tube, DDATP into another one, DDGTP into another one, and DDCTP. So what happens is the DNA polymerase binds to the primer and makes the complementary strands using the DNTPs. But at a particular point along that process, a DDNTP nucleotide could bind. And the sequence, if that happens, will just be terminated. It will stop at that point. So here we can see that it's going along as normal, but then there we go, it's happened to hit a DDNTP, which is in this case DDTTP, because that was the one added to this tube, and it will just end at that point. It won't always stop in that point there because it's random whether it is a DTP or a DDTTP that binds at that point. It may carry on if it's just a normal DTP there, but the D DTTP will bind at some point and it will terminate there. Okay, so this will happen in the equivalent way in all the four samples because remember we added a different type of DDNTP into each of the four tubes. Now, what happens next is you put them all in gel electrophoresis and you put all the ones that had the DDTTP added at the top, DDATP then, DDGTP and DDCTP uh, at the bottom. Electrophoresis is turned on as normal and the fragments will move according to their length. Now these are now organized in shortest fragment length 
to longest fragment length. Shortest on this side and longest on this side. We know that the A there uh, must have been the shortest fragment. Then it must be followed by the G, then the A, then the T, then the C, then the T, then the A, then the G, then the A. We can then match that back onto our strand from shortest to longest. And that gives us our sequence. Now a much newer method is used which is called dye determination. Now in this method each of the four DTNTPs are fluorescently labelled with a different colour and then the fragments are put through something called capillary electrophoresis. Now this is when the dye labelled fragments move in single file past a laser and um, a camera detects them and detects their colour. And it generates these images here where these uh, sort of graphs which show us the sequence by these little peaks of all the different colours. So when Sanger invented DNA sequencing, I doubt he thought it would be possible to sequence the entire human genome. But after a huge international effort, the entire human genome was fully published in 2003. It took hundreds of scientists over 10 years long to do it, and they worked out that it was over 3 billion base pairs long when it was finished. Now Sanger's process would have taken him weeks and weeks and weeks to only read a, a small sample of code, really with all the scientists working together and um, the technology improvements that happened, it was much, much quicker. Now, the Human Genome Project has enabled much progress in medical research. Um, much more is understood about genetic diseases than there were before. They can be identified easily. Effective drugs can be designed and customized therapies can be developed. And we've gained an insight into our evolutionary past from analyzing old human specimens. So it's been highly valuable to work out uh, to, de to sequence the entire human genome. It's also really useful uh, to be able to sequence DNA for taxonomy. Um, the genomes of as many species as possible are being sequenced at the moment, and they're being held in a big database. Things, uh, there's quite a few of them, but there's one called Ensemble. And the processing of this data um, using computers is called bioinformatics, but it's been amazingly useful to look at phylogenetics, um, where you look at the evolutionary history of organisms to work out how closely related they are. It's also, DNA sequencing has also been really useful for clinical diagnosis. Um, you can sequence genomes of viruses and bacterial pathogens, which can help control infectious diseases, things like avian flu and typhoid. Scientists can now quickly identify microbes using the Microbe Bridge database and help stem outbreaks and epidemics. The advancements are amazing. I mean, in 1980s, it would take, you could do a thousand base pairs per minute. In the 2000s, when they did the human genome, it was a thousand base pairs per second. It's now much, much faster than that. Um, to sequence the human genome cost $2.7 billion in 2003. Uh, but now um, a you can sequence a human genome for under $1,000. You can just send off on the internet and get your own genome worked out for you.